Why, hello, and welcome to New York Public Health Now. I'm Dr. Jim McDonald, Commissioner of the New York State Department of Health. And I'm Joanne Morin, the Executive Deputy Commissioner for the Department. And welcome to the 14th floor of Corning Tower, where we overlook Empire State Plaza, even the I Love New York ice skating rink. And Joanne, our streak continues. What is it with sunny weather and recording podcasts? I find it fascinating. Every single time. Yeah, it's amazing. So we're in the fifth episode of season two. Our guest today is Sabrina Dunn, a third year medical student at the University of Buffalo's Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. And before we introduce Sabrina, I'm just so thrilled to have you, Joanne. Joanne, how are you doing today, by the way? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. The weather is picking up, and as you said, it's sunny. So really glad uh, to join you and delighted that Sabrina has agreed to join us remotely today so we can talk about a topic that is so crucial to achieving health equity, diversity among medical professionals. I was in Buffalo last December. This is where I met Sabrina. You know, we were at an event that was organized by the Associated Medical Schools of New York, and Sabrina was one of the speakers. I was there as well. And Sabrina talked about her journey that she's on right now to become a physician and some of the barriers she's overcome as a woman of color. I just found, you know, I have to tell you, like I heard all these speakers, uh, but Sabrina was the one that I remembered. Uh, I think she's just a great speaker. So good to have her. Wow. Well, that certainly says a lot. Sabrina received her undergraduate degree from Cornell University and after that attended the University of Buffalo's post-baccalaureate program, which aims to help traditionally underrepresented students become physicians. Sabrina is now a third year medical student at the University of Buffalo. And we're going to talk more about what a post-baccalaureate program is. And I I do want to mention the University of Buffalo program, among others around the state, are recipients of the Health Department's Diversity in Medicine Initiative. And last year, the department increased its funding for these programs, which what we're trying to do is eliminate health disparities. It's really the Department of Health's purpose in life is eliminating health disparities. You know, when you think about it, there's just no reason why someone should have a different health outcome based on their age, their race, or their cystity, their gender, their orientation, their ability, their first language. We just don't want to have health disparities. People should have the same outcomes. But one of the ways we do that is by trying to make sure we diversify the state's physician workforce. That's right. That's absolutely right. And uh, such an important step toward achieving health equity. Here in New York, more than 30 percent of our population is black or Hispanic, yet Only 12% of our physicians represent these demographics. You know, and there is literature that shows that when patients of color see doctors who represent them, there's positive health outcomes. And, you know, not just improved access to care, not just increased medication adherence and preventive measures, but there's other benefits that come, like, you know, just more likely to have cancer screenings done. So welcome to you, Sabrina, and thank you for joining us from Buffalo today. Thank you both. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, we're good to have you here, Sabrina. Sabrina, why don't we just start with, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, whatever you want to tell us. So I always struggle with the question of where are you from? So I was actually born in the Bronx. And then after a couple of years, my family moved to Middletown, New York. That's in Orange County. And then after a few years, we moved to Spring Valley, New York. That's in Rockland County. However, my entire life, I always went to school in the Bronx, Um, And because of that, I did spend a lot of time in the Bronx. I frequently stayed with my grandparents who live in uh, the Soundview area of the Bronx. So I pretty much split my time pretty evenly between Rockland County, Spring Valley area, and the Bronx. Okay, so thanks, Sabrina. I just had a curiosity. Yankee fan, Met fan, or don't care about baseball at all? If I have to choose, definitely the Yankees. You don't have to choose, and it's totally fine to be a Yankee fan. I'm a Met fan, and we're still thrilled to have you just by all means because <laughs> being a Met fan isn't about winning it's about perseverance and loyalty and those are good virtues too and so Sabrina one of the things I just like to know is you know it's funny when I was going in medical school I remember I met so many other physicians who just said they they knew they wanted to be a, a doctor as long as they could remember and I you know I don't know if that's you it wasn't me by the way like I didn't realize I wanted to be a doctor until I was well into college I said, when did you know you wanted to pursue medicine, if you could talk about that, and maybe why you wanted to pursue medicine? Um, I think growing up, I always idealized the idea of becoming a physician, but I wasn't necessarily intentional about it until I got to college. As you stated before, I went to Cornell University, where I was a member of the class of 2019, and at Cornell, I studied nutritional sciences. And that major required the core sciences that are pretty typical for pre-med, the bio, the chemistry, the physics. However, the major 
um, didn't stop there. It also included courses that taught me the same topics as the core sciences, but applied in a way that was more interesting and applicable to me. So the classes I took were nutrition, health, and society, physical and chemical properties of food, obesity and the regulation of body weight, um, social perspectives of food. And as lifestyle modifications and lifestyle becomes the leading variable influencing health outcomes, this major really primed me for an interest in medicine. Additionally, my freshman year in college, I kind of stumbled into some sociology classes that really heightened my interest in social inequality. So my goal to pursue medicine really came to fruition due to the intersection of these two fields. The nutrition major gave me the scientific knowledge contextualized to the human body in a way that was relevant to today's major health issues. And the sociology minor exposed me to the complexities of social inequality. And those two fields kind of organically brought me to medicine and grew my desire to reduce health disparities. I completely can understand and relate to the interest in sociology, so thank you for sharing that. While the post-baccalaureate program has been around for more than 30 years, there are a lot of people who I imagine may not be familiar with the program. Can you tell us a bit about it? Of course. So the AMSNY post-baccalaureate program is um, a program that several New York State medical schools participate in, some of the private schools and the public, so Buffalo, Stony Brook, Upstate, Downstate, Hofstra, Einstein, Rochester, just some of them um, who choose to participate. And the way that it works is basically during the application process, these schools select a handful of students who they want and they nominate for this program. Each year, it's about 20 to 25 students, typically underrepresented minorities, who they feel like could benefit from a little more support in the core sciences. So they are nominated to participate in this program that requires you to complete an additional year of study at the University of Buffalo, followed by matriculation into medical school. Matriculation is conditional upon a GPA requirement. Each school has a little bit of different requirements, but it pretty much falls in the same realm of pretty high standards for GPA. Um, Additionally, the curriculum is pretty rigorous. It includes courses in genetics, human physiology, anatomy, pharmacology, some of the classes that I know I hadn't taken in undergrad. So the purpose is really to strengthen your foundation and fill in any gaps that they might have noticed in your application so that they can all but guarantee academic success in medical school. You can't apply to this program. You have to be nominated when they see your application during the medical, the typical medical school application cycle, and you are selected for this conditional acceptance. Wow, that sounds exceptional. I know we said earlier, and and you had uh, also spoken about your undergraduate degree from Cornell. Can you talk about the experience? Were there any hurdles that you faced? So... I should distinguish my social experience from my academic one. Socially, it was fine. I made friends, made great memories. Um, Pretty typical college experience, and it definitely primed me for the Buffalo winters that I'm currently experiencing. (laughs) Academically, I think the pre-med experience at Cornell is a unique one in that I, I believe when I was a freshman, the the term or the the rumor was like one in five incoming freshmen were pre-med. And with over 3,000 or 4,000 students in each class, that's just a massive number of students who are at least claiming that they want to pursue medicine. So this just creates such a hyper competitive atmosphere that is not really conducive to sharing resources, working together um, or much collaboration at all. I remember when I was in undergrad, there were rumors about people damaging textbooks so that other people couldn't study from them, from the library copy. And it was just really a hyper-competitive kind of pressure cooker environment. Every class is is curved to a certain grade. So if you're below the mean, you know, that's not particularly great for uh, being a candidate for medical school. So it was just really a competitive atmosphere. Additionally, being in such a a large institution, I struggled feeling like a small fish in a large pond. Um, I'm naturally very introverted, so I really struggled in a setting like this. 
And with pre-med classes of frequently over 300 students, it was really hard to feel comfortable seeking help, asking questions. And it was really just, it was a tough time. I did appreciate my non-pre-med nutrition courses. Those were kind of contextualized in a way that was more interesting and those were less just intense. The air of them was a little bit lighter because there weren't so many pre-meds in the class, which really made me persevere because I knew I liked the material and I loved what it represented and how it was actually applicable to health sciences. But sometimes those pre-med classes and that that atmosphere was was pretty was pretty tense. <laughs> so we're talking to Sabrina Dunn, third year medical student at University of Buffalo. And Sabrina, one of the things I was just thinking about you talking about was how competitive it was in college. And it's just interesting because when you think about actually practicing medicine as a physician, it's really a team-based effort. It really, it's it's when you think about care to patients, it's very team-based, which is interesting. And, and when I heard you speak in Buffalo last December, you you were really authentic, and you talked about one particular barrier you faced called imposter syndrome. And you know, I, I thought you were one of the first people I ever talked about imposter syndrome, and I thought that was very interesting. You did, and so could you just talk about what is imposter syndrome and how did how did it affect you as a student? So imposter syndrome is a common phenomenon where people have persistent doubt over their abilities and accomplishments. They feel that they're a fraud, that they don't belong in this space, that they don't deserve a certain title. And especially as the world becomes more competitive in the workplace, in academia, the people who end up occupying these spaces really struggle to see themselves as deserving and can lack confidence in in themselves. When I was a first year medical student, it was not uncommon to hear people make jokes that, oh, admission probably accidentally accepted me and then they felt bad and just let me stay or people felt like they just didn't deserve to be here. It was all just a a, a, a coincidence, but that's not the case. And it's important to be confident in your capabilities, especially if you're going to be a physician and have people's lives in your hands. You have to feel confident in yourself that you are capable, you are excellent, you were hand selected for this role, and it was not an accident or a mistake, but an intentional choice to put you in this position. As an undergrad, I really struggled with imposter syndrome. In the beginning, I was really, really scared of speaking out asking questions, seeking support out of fear of sounding dumb, uh, informing the masses that I wasn't intelligent and I didn't deserve this space. And it was really emotionally exhausting. And this definitely impacted my academic performance. I was not comfortable going to professors and asking for help, speaking out in study groups, anything like that. And In time, I've grown. I'm confident that I deserve to be here. I understand and have the emotional intelligence to know that that was something that a lot of people fear and and experience. And it took a lot of intentional work to kind of get past that. And now I feel that confident in my abilities and my grades show it. Administration tells me I belong here. And I just feel at peace at this time. Yeah, good for you, Sabrina. Good for you. Uh, I mean, thank you for being so honest with us. I think a lot of people identify with the journey you're talking about, and I think that's great. There was there was something else you said, though, when you spoke that day that really resonated with me as well. And you talked about being part of the post-baccalaureate program. It was a 180-degree shift from your prior experience as an undergraduate. And you talked a little bit about this. Can you tell us a little more, more about how the diversity in medicine program helped you? So my experience with the diversity in medicine program was through the post-bac, which provided me the opportunity to strengthen my scientific, my science foundation prior to medical school so I can ensure academic success and navigate medical school with confidence. And it really prepares you for the academic rigor of medical school. And I, in a lot of ways, I feel And many of my friends feel that the post-bac was just as, if not harder, than medical school, just because of the level of the rigor of the coursework. And additionally, as I mentioned before, the post-bac only includes 20 to 25 students. 
that facilitates a small group setting that is stark in comparison to my very large class size of enter, of Cornell University of my undergrad experience where you're walking in as a freshman with really no friends or emotional support. So this small group setting really made a difference. Additionally, because of the structure of the post back, there's no competition. We all have our own conditional acceptances. You already have a guaranteed spot at a medical school that nominated you to this program. You have nothing to lose or gain by another person's academic success. So why not support your fellow peer? If anything, you want to see them succeed. You want to see them win. So we kind of developed a we're all in this together kind of at, uh, attitude and because we were all like-minded, driven, goal-oriented individuals navigating the exact same journey. So with no weight of competition, it was a really collaborative experience. We always studied together. We always were supporting each other, guiding each other. If one person was struggling a little bit in a class, we all, I mean all of us, would really work together to make sure all of us were academically successful so that we could matriculate. And over time, we grew into friends because this is a unique experience. And now I have a priceless bond with my future physician colleagues of color across New York State. That, that's really incredible. Now that you're more than halfway through your medical education, can you tell us what surprised you the most about attending University of Buffalo? What surprised me the most was the really strong sense of community here at UB that really makes it quite an enjoyable experience. Most of the people in the school, my classmates, administration, professors, are really kind and approachable. I really think admission tries to get personable, likable people so that we can create um, kind physicians. Overall, I feel like the medical school tries will genuinely cares about its students and creates like a robust support system. Additionally, I have some really great friends here that really keep me sane during such a stressful time. And we really go out to go out of our way to try and learn and experience the different um, cultural experiences here in Buffalo, whether it's the the museums, the food festivals, the nature hiking scene is really fun out here. And it's been really enjoyable creating new memories. Coming from New York City, I was afraid there would be nothing to do here, but I was pleasantly surprised. And a lot of my friends are from the city or California or all over. And honestly, it's a really good experience. So kind of both, having really good friends here, finding fun things to do, and having a really supportive administration and institution supporting you. That's great. And I have to ask you on the other end, have you had any challenges or what was perhaps one of the biggest challenges you've faced? So my biggest challenge, I would say, is the field that I want to go into post-medical education is physical medicine and rehabilitation or physiatry. Shorthand is PM&R. And sadly, University of Buffalo does not have a residency program in the area which kind of makes it hard to get clinical or research opportunities um, that is kind of expected with uh, residency applications and things like that. However, the school is pretty supportive. I've made large efforts to create my own experiences and independent study with the support of my school. Additionally, there's a handful of other students that are also interested in PM&R, and we all really support each other. Again, circling back to the kind nature of a lot of the students at the school. We all support each other as we navigate this unique situation because we're passionate about pursuing this field. But is it is a little bit of a challenge, but, you know, it builds grit. You know, Sabrina, I'm just curious, you know, it's been really quite a ride for you at this point. And when you look back over the last year in particular, any feel-good moments that you'd like to just share with us? Yeah, I feel, I feel very lucky that I went to UB because... Both of my siblings have been or are in the area at a given point in time. So my sister is actually an alumni of the Jacobs School of Medicine, class of 2022. Um, So when I was a post back in a first year, we actually lived in the same apartment complex. So that was great to kind of live right next to 
your sister and be able to hang out with her all the time. And my brother studied at University of Buffalo. Um, he graduated from, uh, he graduated with his undergraduate degree in exercise science in 2022, but he is now obtaining his uh, master's in public health at UB. So we hang out all the time. He actually picked me up from the airport last week and we have regular Sunday dinners. So being here, despite being in a being in medical school, which is traditionally very stressful and very emotionally draining, I have a pretty strong support system with my brother and sister. My sister's no longer here, but she was here for the first two years. And my brother is still here. So having family in the area is really, really a blessing. It's, I'm really lucky to be in this situation. Yeah, good for you. So as much as you have going on now, I have to ask the question, what are you thinking about for next steps after medical school? Um, well, I want to apply into the field of pm and I kind of mentioned this and touched on this before. Um, hopefully matching into that field. It's a really small field. A lot of people don't know about it. Uh, most people have never even heard of it. Um, but I really love what the field represents. It's a medical specialty that involves restoring the function for people who have been disabled as a result of disease or injury. Um, I took anatomy my M1 year and loved it. And then I took neurology in my MSK musculoskeletal unit and loved it. And I went out of my way to find shadowing opportunities and clinical opportunities, and it really solidified my love for the field in conjunction with what it represents. Um, so hopefully going on to match into the field of my choice. And yeah. You know, Sabrina, I think you're right. I don't think a lot of people know about the profession of physical medicine and rehabilitation because it's not a common area of medicine. You know, I didn't even know it existed till I was in medical school. And you know, a classmate of mine went into this, and I think, you know, they might be someone who helps someone who's had a stroke get to a more full recovery. Someone who's had a car accident might get to a more full recovery. They sometimes help people with pain, you know, with interventions they do that aren't related to narcotics. So I think it is a very important uh, profession, and I think it's a good example of who you are as a person, you know, because what I'm really pulling together is you really care about other people. And you can see that when people have had a disabling injury, they need help, and I think I can see in you someone who wants to give them that help, and that's a beautiful thing to do. So I want to thank you for joining us today for our conversation. It's been great to have Sabrina Dunn, third-year medical student at the Jacobs School of Medicine at the University of Buffalo, who's part of our Diversity in Medicine program, and she called in today from Buffalo. Great to have you, Sabrina. Thank you so much for having me. As we bring our episode to a close today, we do talk about the why, and sometimes the why is diversity in medicine is important. We really want to make sure that the physicians and healthcare providers who take care of us often represent the populations they take care of. And Sabrina, you are a great example of that as well. By the way, if you're one of our listeners and you have a topic that you think would be of interest, go ahead and email us at publichealthnowpodcast at health.ny.gov. Keep an eye out for the latest New York Public Health Now episode on your favorite podcast player like Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify, YouTube, and Google Podcasts. Search by our podcast title, New York Public Health Now, or by keyword NYSDOH. It even works on the Alexa device. If you say Alexa, play New York Public Health Now, Alexa's all over. There you go. So for New York Public Health Now podcast, I'm Dr. Jim McDonald. I'm Joanne Morin. And I'm Sabrina Dunn. And thank you for listening. New York Public Health Now is a production of New York State Department of Health's Public Affairs Group. Michael Wren is the executive producer and engineer, with additional production support provided by Sarah Snyder, Janine Babakian, Barbara Stubblebein, Alicia Biggs, Monica Pomeroy, and Kyle Koteri. Copyright 2024, all rights reserved. We welcome your feedback please email us at publichealthnowpodcast at health.ny.gov.